Hey, Rifters, welcome to the show. Subscribe, rate, review. Tell a friend. We got a great show today. Uh, he was the, the winner of the second season of America's Got Talent. He's a national uh, headliner. Uh, he's a ventriloquist. I've been practicing that word all day. Ventriloquist. I think I got it. He's a ventriloquist. Ah, I screwed it up. Hold on. Let's restart. He's an amazing ventriloquist. Yeah, I got it that time, huh? Yeah. Well, he, it's going to be on the Zoom. And he's on Razor Riffs, the great Terry Fader, guys. And uh, it's uh, going to be fun. I, uh, I became a Terry Fader fan. I'm actually going to tell him this because I think it's important. But I became a ter uh, Terry Fader fan. Uh, because I I don't really watch America's Got Talent. I mean, I, there's times where I do watch it, but I don't I don't like binge watch every single episode. And um, I don't know, five or six months ago, they had like a America's Got Talent All Stars, and Terry Fader was on it, and I just thought it was so amazing and so talented what he did that I looked at all his other stuff and I just became like a huge, huge fan. I was very fascinated with that. And, uh, yeah. So I, I, I'm very, very psyched to, to interview him because I think, I think it was cool. All right, guys. Well, uh, if you like it, subscribe, brain review, uh, Keith has all, all, all the shows updated. And, uh, Enjoy my interview with a great comedian, ventriloquist, Terry Fader. You're listening to Razor Riffs with Keith Razor and Alan Lee right here on LA Talk Radio. Hello. Hey, Terry. How are you? Very good. Oh, thank you so much for uh, podcasting with me this fine evening. You are very welcome. I'm happy to be doing it. Oh, man. Where are you Stop. podcasting from? Uh, I'm in Huntington Beach. Oh, okay. The great, cool. the cool. great the city. Coast. Yeah. <laughs> the great city of surfing angels. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm And I'm in Las Vegas. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I, I was actually in Vegas uh, a couple months ago doing stand-up. I tried to get this, like, if I could meet you at New York, New York or something. Uh, yeah, because, like, when I when I do stand-up, I like just interviewing everybody to try and get them in the can. You know what I mean? Yeah, yeah, I know what you mean. Yeah. I'm glad we were able to finally work it out. Yeah, this is awesome. So I wanted to, I wanted to tell you a, a little, because uh, – I'm. I feel embarrassed to say, but I for about four or five months ago, I was watching America's Got Talent All Stars, mm -hmm. and I saw you on it, and I thought you were fascinating, and I instantly fell in love with you, and I had no idea you you won the second season. So like I was watching, <laughs> I was watching all your other stuff. I was like, this guy is very talented, and and one thing I really appreciate it is like you're very inspiring. So. Thank you. Well, thank you. Thank you. Yeah. That's one of the reasons why I did, uh, why I actually did the, the uh, America's Got Talent All-Stars was first of all, to uh, introduce myself to a whole new, uh, a whole new group of fans. And, uh, and secondly, I wanted to get some international exposure. So. Yeah. Well, I, I am, I'm a, I'm a Terry Fader fan now. And uh, I apologize if you get questions you've heard a million times, but. I don't, I don't mind. It's the nature of the beast. Okay. So uh, the one thing I do like about like the technology we have is like uh, Google helps you pronounce words and I have a speech stutter. So I've been working all day how to say ventriloquist. <laughs> it is hard. In, in fact, a lot of um, ventriloquists can't say it without moving their lips. 
So they have to change it to they make it a, try to make a comedy thing out of it. And they say ventriculist instead of a ventriloquist. <laughs> so it's a difficult word to say. So yeah. it's a real tongue and, twister. And then, of course, one of my characters says ventriloquist just as a fun, you know, but I do have another one that actually says he knows he's a ventriloquist, doesn't he? So I can I can say it without moving my lips, but, but a lot uh, of ventriloquists can't. Well, I just want you to know if I accidentally butcher it, please correct me. I don't mean it out of offense. <laughs> Like, this is why I'd be a terrible actor, because there's words that I can't say. I'd be like, what's another meaning for the word R? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> but um, so the thing that I found out about you, which I thought was very fascinating, was you started when you were 10 years old. And uh, I wanted to know, like, because usually when people are 10, they don't like their dreams are kind of oh, I want to be a fireman or a spaceman or something. So, like, what was uh, – how did you come into that? You know, it was – there was never – I never, ever wanted to be anything but an entertainer. Yeah. So from my – one of my very first memories is standing on a table singing to a bunch of adults. I was three – around three. I don't know. I may have been earlier, but I don't – and I was singing a song, and people were laughing and clapping and cheering and – and I, I, re I distinctly remember thinking, I really like this. This is this is good. And so it never left me. Um, I would, of course, go out for all of the school talent shows. Uh, and then I, I was a magician when I started doing ma magic when I was eight. Uh, did that until, you know, for a couple of years. And then uh, and then I found a book on how to be a ventriloquist when I was 10. And the, I think the thing that really sold me, uh, you know, this was 1975, way before you were born. Yeah. And so 1975, $10 was a lot. Uh, I mean, um, uh, you know, money was worth a lot more in, in 1975 than it is now. Yeah, and $10 remember, for a 10 year old is like a million dollars. Oh yeah. It was a lot back then. Yeah. But, but what really got me was there was a, a, a ventriloquist book that, that had a copy of a contract at a club where this guy was saying, you can actually make money doing this. And, and it said that he got $500 Oh, my God. doing a performance. And as for a 10 year old, that really was a fortune. I'm thinking $500. You can make $500 to to play with puppets. And so from then on, I never deviated from my dream of being a uh, of, of being an entertainer and a ventriloquist. I did have a band for about 15 years and I was the lead vocalist of the band. But even even that time, I would pull out a puppet and I would do a, do a routine with my puppet and have my puppet sing. So it was always kind of in my DNA to be a ventriloquist. I have to ask you, what was the name of your band? Was it the Puppets? <laughs> no, it was Texas the Band. We I grew up in <laughs> Dallas, Texas. I grew up in the Dallas area, Dallas, Texas area, and so um, I just want it was a country rock band, and we yeah. would play all the bars and all the, um, you know, we played all these all these honky tonks and bars and um, and it was a lot of fun. It was a good way to hone my craft. And yeah. so we do about 10 or 10 or 15 minutes of music. And then I would pull out a puppet and I would have my puppet uh, sing, a, a you know, an old an old fashioned country song by Roy Rogers or or Hank Williams Sr. or something like that. And so it was always a lot of fun. Oh, my God. That's awesome. Now, uh, when did you start putting humor into the, 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 the puppets? Like like when did you say, hey, uh, because I think that a lot of people probably do it, but they don't really try with humor you know what i mean they just try and do their impression and there i think that's a different art you know yeah you mean uh, you mean the impressions i um i i was always doing impressions in fact there was a, there was an old comedian named jose jimenez who would do an um uh, a mexican accent and yeah. they would do these comedy routines he'd say my name is jose jimenez i'm a teenager baseball star you know so i love Sounds this just like him <laughs> I, I love those old voices you know and so I would, when I got my puppets, my first puppet, I didn't know how to write routines and I didn't know anything. So I would do these, I would do these uh, routines that I had on my, on a record. And, you know, back, if, you, if you don't remember what a record is, it's like a vinyl and it, and it plays on a record player. Yeah. And so it was, um, so it was so much fun because I would, I would be the straight man and I would have my puppet talk in Jose Jimenez's voice. And so those were the first routines I did. And then I found some routine books. And I also went and saw a couple of ventriloquists. I saw Jeff Dunham when I was 10. Oh my and, God. Uh, and I, I stole one of his bits. You know, I was 10. I didn't know you weren't supposed to steal bits. Yeah. So I used, I used a couple of the bits that I saw Jeff Dunham do. He was, he must've been like 13 or 14 at that time. Wow. Um, and so he, cause he's about three, three to four years older than me. 
And so I used uh, some of his routines until I was, you know, probably 15. And then I started to kind of play around with writing my own material. And I would go, I would buy um, comedy, I'd buy joke books and I would find my favorite jokes and I'd catalog them and I would put together routines based on those jokes. And so that's really how, and then I started learning how to actually write my own humor and write my own jokes and stuff. Yeah. It's, it's funny that, uh, well, it's not funny, but, but it's, um, I'll think of the word when I come up with it, but it's very unique that you said that when you were younger, you, you, I don't know if you purposely did, but you stole bits because when I was younger, I did a talent show for my school and I did stand up. This is how I got into stand up, I guess. Uh, and I totally saw Richard Pryor's bit and nobody mm-hmm. thought it was funny for like eight year olds. <laughs> well, see, that that's <laughs> it's actually very common. Uh, that's how a lot of comedians uh, work and a lot of entertainers work. We don't until you learn, you know, when you're young. I mean, if you're eight or 10 years old, you don't you know, you see something you think is funny and you do it. You don't realize yeah. you don't it, you know, you have to actually that's part of the learning process. But also it's part of the it's. It's part of the process. You know, I, I actually hear people will tell me, um, they'll say, oh, I saw a ventriloquist and he was doing one of your routines word for word from your first DVD. And I'm like, good for them. I hope they're making money on it because I don't do those routines. You know, the, I, those routines are, you know, 16 years old. So I'm like, good. You know, it doesn't bother me. Um, and they're like, but they did it word for word. And I'm like, hey, listen, I'm not even using those routines anymore. It's on DVD. As far as I'm concerned, it's public domain. They they're welcome. They're welcome to take them because I'm always creating and 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 constantly cr- coming up with new stuff. So um, so you know, if people want to use my material, my thing is I just need to make sure and do it better than they do. Right. Yeah. Because it, that that is the thing too. Because like uh, people do still jokes and stuff, but I feel uh, if the person who wrote it, you know, does it better, like there's no reason to be worried about it. You know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. And and but an, another thing is there are it's there's it, there's nothing at all wrong with hearing a really funny joke and then saying, "Man, that is hilarious. I'm going to rewrite that so that it's my joke and and using the same basic principle. In fact, it's an incredibly common in comedy. It's actually common in music as well. You'll hear a song that you absolutely love yeah. and you'll write a song um kind of inspired by that and it sounds a little like it but it's but it's your song that's kind of the same way i mean I, i'll hear somebody tell a hilarious joke i still listen to old edgar bergen and charlie mccarthy um uh, tapes yeah and i you know now of course i have them on uh i i have sirius xm um old time radio but i also have a thing called old time radio and it has hundreds of edgar bergen charlie mccarthy and anytime i hear a really funny joke i'll i'll write it down and then i'll rewrite it and use it in my show but oh I won't do it word for word, but I actually will say, oh, that's a great, that's hilarious. And I mean, this yeah. might have been done in 1935, you know? So so even if I was to take it word for word, it, it would be re- reviving it. But I don't, I always like to to change it just a little bit to make it mine. So well, but you it, can it, write my I, own. Stuff. That is an exercise to get the juices flowing though. Mm-hmm. It is. Yeah. So uh, do you remember the first puppet you had? And like, because I, I think all your puppets, you have a, a discreet relationship with them. Like, it's like a friendship. You got to get to know them and all that stuff. So, yeah, um, I still have my very first puppet. He's in a shadow box that I've um, that I have at uh, that I have in warehouse right now because I don't have any place to put him. But I will eventually get him back up on the wall. Um, but, yeah, he's a cool little puppet. Um, he was just a $10 puppet that I actually re I built a new body for him. And, uh, I, the book that I, that I found in my school library was called ventriloquism for fun and profit. And it actually taught you how to, how to build, how to do some working. So I was able to use the blueprints in there to, to build a body for him. And then I put a stick on his head and I made it so I could turn his head. And I used that for a couple of years, uh, and, and performed at churches and birthday parties so that I could save my money and get my first um semi-professional puppet and then when i was 18 i was able to get my my first real puppet and that real like professional puppet and he's still in my act is walter t airdale my cowboy oh nice now with all these puppets that you have do do you uh have someone help you design them or like how how's the process on that because like when you say hey listen this is what i want like yes i actually I actually do. I design. I I did do all of the designing, but I do not do the actual work um, on building. I I have no talent whatsoever 
in that kind of thing at all. Yeah. <laughs> so, wow. I have to, um, so I have to, uh, just, just help them. I can't even draw. I'm like barely, I'm not, not a good artist. I mean, uh, so I actually will hire like a couple of times I've hired real Disney animators, kind of like a, a police sketch artist where I'll say, I want this, I want this puppet, uh, to look like this. Like I have a beetle puppet called, um, his name is hyphen. Yeah. He claims to be the fifth beetle that was kicked out of the Beatles early on. And hyphen, uh, I told the, this Disney artist, I said, I really want you to kind of draw me a character that has features from all four of the Beatles. And yeah. so he drew it up and then I hired a guy to, uh, to build him. Oh. Uh, I just, I'm just not good with, with building and working. I I'm good with creating, uh, ideas and creating routines and writing jokes and, and creating characters, but I'm not good at doing the, the physical work. So I just hire, but you know, before I, I would have to actually just find in a catalog and buy puppets. But once America's got talent hit and I was able to get a, a gig in Vegas, now I'm able to afford the best puppet makers on the planet, you know, that, yeah. that to, make some, uh, to make a truly unique and, and original characters. Yeah. Well, after this interview, if you don't mind to DM me who these guys are, because like I when I saw you on, on America's Got Talent on the All Stars and you were doing the Elton uh, John puppet, I was just fascinated because, I mean, he he's still alive, you know, what I mean, but like there, there's going to be a time where he, he passes. But I, I lost my best friend two years ago and I toured with him. I just thought it would be cool to get a puppet for him, you know, to, to I don't know. I thought that was just so cool. You know what I mean? I don't know. Yeah, I, he was, uh, my Elton John puppet was made by Puppet Heap out of Hoboken, New Jersey, um, and or Hoboken. I don't know how you say it, but it's uh, Hoboken, New Jersey. And um, they're the same company that actually works with the Muppets, and they do the repairs and things on, on Jim Henson's Muppets. So Really? Oh uh, yeah, God. so this is like the best of the best of the best. Although there are so many good ones, Landon Harvey out of Dallas, uh, Barry Gordimer uh, uh, is is incredible. I've got I've got a Britney Spears and a uh, and a Dua Lipa puppet that that uh, Barry Gordimer did that that are just spectacular. You can look on YouTube and see my Britney Spears singing with Elton John. Um, but you know, Chance Wolf is another incredible puppet maker. Keith Lovick is one is the one that made Walter T. Airedale. Um, you know, so I I and Steve Axtell is is another staple. He's one of the greatest of the great of the puppet makers. And so just Axtell expressions or Axtell.com. And, uh, and you can look at his unbelievably fantastic work and he's made several, uh, uh, original puppets for me. And oh when you're God. looking into original depends on who it is, they can get very, very pricey. Oh, well, I mean, I, I'm, I'm one of those fellas where like, uh, I don't have any money, but to me, my money doesn't really matter. You know what I mean? Like I'm, yeah. I'm so, yeah, uh, see, I mean, money matters if you want to get an original puppet by a good puppet maker. You have yeah, to. yeah, but like, I, I, I could, I could, you know, I'll, I'll save for it. That's what I'm saying. Yeah. Like, I, I don't know. I mean, uh, but no, when I do get my puppet, I want to come to Vegas and be like, "Hey, Terry, this is my Norm Macdonald puppet." <laughs> <laughs> so I love Norm Macdonald. He's one of the great, one of the true great com comedians. It was so sad when he passed. Yeah, he was, he was my best friend. Um. So then I wanted to ask you, before you got on America's Got Talent from when you won, uh, how how hard was it? Like, how how is that journey to get on America's Got Talent? And did you think you would go to winning? No. Okay. Uh, the journey to get there had its highs and lows, its ups and downs. Um, there were times when I was incredibly discouraged because I was really hoping that one day I would hit it and hit it big and become famous and start making big money. And uh, and I felt like that I had worked hard enough and I deserved it and I had the talent to, and it just didn't seem to want to happen. So, uh, but what really happened was I stopped focusing on that. I started focusing on being grateful for the life that I did have. You know, even though I was playing uh, elementary schools and, and middle schools and fairs, county fairs, I was making a decent living. You know, most people don't get to do what they absolutely love to do and make a living and pay the bills. So while I yeah. was probably in my mind, probably may never have gotten rich and famous. I I was still very blessed because I got to, I got to do something that, that I looked forward to every single day. So <clears throat> I, uh, so once I kind of hit that point, 
then it was just, I was enjoying my life. I was enjoying the fact that I could, uh, you know, every time I got on stage, even if it was in front of first graders, I didn't care. I was still entertaining. I got to make them laugh and giggle and, and, uh, and entertain the teachers and the principal and, and all that. So we did that. And then, uh, just being able to, uh, to enjoy my life. And then, uh, you know, I, then I found America's Got Talent. Did not think I was going to win. I thought I was going to get on three or four episodes like anyone else and get kicked off. And then I could double my price at elementary schools. But, right. you, know, things, you know, fate had a different plan for me. Yeah. Everyone tells me, because like when I when I started stand up, they're like, you should get on a America's Got Talent. You know what I mean? Like they always said that. And it's like, well, yeah, I've tried. I don't know how. Well, I mean, now it's easier because you send videos in, you know, you can, you do a performance and you send a video. It used to be, you'd had to go and stand in long, long lines. And, cattle call. Yeah. Oh yeah. It was, it was a uh, much more brutal than it used. I don't know if they still do that, but I know that, that anyone can submit, um, through a video. I have a good friend who I, I keep telling her to, um, she needs to keep trying. She keeps getting rejected. And I'm like, Wilma, you got to keep trying. You just got to keep trying. Yeah. Um, don't, don't let it get you down, you know, and just keep going. Cause you know, I can't even tell you how many times I was 42 when, when I w went on America's Got Talent and won. And I can't even count the times that I was rejected. Yeah. And, you know, if you give up, you give up, it's over. You know, if you stop working toward the dream, the dream really does die. But as long as you're, you're still trying and still, you never know what could happen, you know? That's, so you just got to keep, keep trying. That's true. Now, from from uh, America's Got Talent winner like yourself, uh, do you believe that in the future a stand-up comedian could actually win, or do you think like I that? Do. Really? No, I absolutely do. I really do believe that a, a stand-up comedian could win America's Got Talent. Uh, um, as long as they're funny, as long as they're original, and as long as uh, you know their, their comedy is relevant, uh, no doubt about it. I do believe it. Awesome. Cool. And then, uh, so the one the one thing I wanted to ask you, this is probably going to be the oddest question you'll ever hear, but uh, I saw you on Cameo, and I wanted to, I'm on, like, not to brag, but I'm on Cameo, too. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Anyways, so I wanted to ask you, what's the oddest Cameo request you've ever gotten? Oh, man, I don't really get many odd ones. Um, it's mostly just people, oh, birthdays, Mother's Day, things like this. I have had some people try to get me to endorse a product. Oh, and I'm like, no, I'm not going to endorse a product on Cameo. They're like, oh, hey, check this new soda out. It, you know, <laughs> and I'm like, no, you're not going to pay. You know, I, I, and I, I'm way cheaper than almost <laughs> anyone else on there. And my, it drives my wife crazy. She wants to up. And I said, no, the reason I set my price so low is because I want people to be able to afford it. I do. I, I'm on Cameo for my fans. I'm not on it for me. Yeah. I'm on it because I want my fans to be able to get a birthday wish or a, you know, or something like that. So, so it's important to me. And, and so 100% for the fans, but I will not, the, the oddest, I've had a few of them where they're like, Oh, you know, can you tell me, can you tell everybody how much you love this product? And I just immediately say, no, I do not do endorsements. <laughs> you want an endorsement deal, contact my agent, <laughs> you know, and we'll do a real endorsement deal. <laughs> uh, just to make you laugh after the interview, I'm going to buy a cameo from you that says, hey, check out my new soda. <laughs> <laughs> well, it won't cost you anything because I'll I'll reject it. <laughs> I think the oddest cameo request I ever got was like they 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 said, "Hey Keith, can you just say that you like the Lion King?" And I was like, "All right." I mean, because I only charge five dollars, so like I was like, "Oh wow!" <laughs> yeah, I was like, "I like the Lion King." I don't know why that was funny, but. Yeah, that's uh, I think that that's one of those websites that is actually really good for people, because if people can't for financial reasons or they don't live close to you and they can never see you live, I think it's a good way to get something from you for them. You know what I mean? Well, that's why I tour also, you know, I I, I will get requests, uh, you know, email requests or, or DM requests and people will say, uh you know, I can't travel. My grandpa really loves you and he wants to see you and he can't travel. Is there any way you can come to the Columbus, Ohio area? And I will, I actually call my agent and say, Hey, I'm, I'm getting some requests from Columbus. Can you try to book a show there so that we can get out there for the fans who can't travel? So that's really why I do it. Yeah. Now, uh, what was it like, uh, 
uh, switching casinos because I, I'm, I'm assuming you switched casinos during the pandemic, right? Well, yeah, we had it planned and there was going to be a big um, ad campaign with me, you know, uh, oh, I'm moving. I moved over um, because they wanted to they wanted to get Shin Lim in the room. I had been in the room for 11 years and I was I was ready for a change as well. So we had this whole thing planned where I was going to move over to New York, New York. And then we were all shut down in March. We were going to do that in June of 2020. And wow. then in March, everything shut down and the entire city was shut down entertainment wise for a year. So it was March 2021 before they reopened. And that's when I started it at New York, New York. And uh, um, so it was just one of those things that that happened. And <clears throat> the next thing you know, I was at the New York, New York casino. But I love it. It's it's a great casino. Wow. Now, what was that like? Like the first couple months coming back? Was it difficult for you? Because Oh, no. It was fantastic. I was, I I had never gone since I became a professional entertainer. I had never gone so long without actually performing. And I was, you know, it's like a drug to me. I love getting on stage. So, you know, I'll go on vacation for two weeks. And after a week, I'm like, oh God, when I want this next week to go by fast because I can't wait to get home and start performing again. I just love to perform. Yeah. I remember before the, the shutdown, you know, I was like, oh, my God, I need a break because I'm doing so many weeks and stuff. And then the shutdown happened. And I was like, excellent. What a break. And then, every, you know, I heard it was a big COVID scare and everyone's dying. I was like, this is not a good break. And then, <laughs> then like, uh, when we came back, uh, we were doing social distancing shows, which, you know, it was cool to get back. But, like, you would do stand up and people would be in the car and instead of you couldn't hear laughing, they'd honk and you'd be like, really? That was rough. Yeah. <laughs> I did. I did some comedy clubs where there was some, I did four comedy clubs, which was kind of dream of mine. I always wanted to play comedy clubs and wasn't ever able to, but um, so it was kind of fun to do that during COVID. But uh, yeah, COVID was not the break that I wanted. Um, I, I love taking breaks and it was kind of nice for maybe three weeks. And then it was like, Oh my God. And then because it was supposed to be two weeks to flatten the curve and then it just kept going on and on. So I was never like terrified of COVID. I was never, I, I, I realized that it was mostly a risk for the elderly. It was not yeah. huge. And I, I'm not in, in terrible shape, you know, for people who have health, uh, you know, already have health problems. It was really bad. So yeah. my wife Angie and I went to uh, Disney world three times. It was open and we, we uh, flew, from Vegas, never got sick, never had any problems, uh, had a wonderful time. And so, uh, so I took advantage of the time to not, I wasn't hunkering down, terrified, you know, wearing masks outside. I, I never did. I, I never took the, the thing seriously. I mean, I, I would took it seriously. It wasn't like I was denying it was happening because it was, and there were a lot of people hosp hospitalized. No, no, definitely. Yeah. I know what you're trying to say. The yeah. ones who were the, at most risk for it were the, were the elderly people, you know, 80 and above. And, and so that was really bad for them. But uh, so I just I just never let it let the fear kind of grip me and take me over. So, I, you know, we uh, we did some traveling and and really enjoyed it. We went to see family and, and had a wonderful time. It was uh, uh, during it. But I was I missed working, horribly missed working. So, yeah, definitely. It was, it was also like uh, it, like joke wise, because I know your jokes are pretty clean and family family oriented but like me i like to think i'm clean but i have some dirty stuff it's very hard to to do stuff you know with everything that's going on as a stand-up comedian so you gotta be you're it's like you're walking on glass shells you know what yeah. i mean it's a little harder for for you than it would be for me because when a puppet says it people take it don't, don't tend to take it seriously i do get complaints <laughs> i don't i don't set out to offend people though Right. I really just want to be funny. And so I can get away with more than a stand up comedian could, but I don't really, you know, I'm certainly never trying to offend somebody. But if something tickles me and somebody, I, and I feel like something is funny, I'm going to do it. And if somebody doesn't like it and complains, I, I, that's fine, you know, but I don't do dirty stuff. I do, I, I do stuff that is, um, that is just, I tap dance on the line, let's put it, you know, I, I, yeah. Do some uh, mildly adult material. I I like to say my show is PG thirteen. You know, it could be G, and I've done G shows, but it's you know I'm a Vegas headliner. I I, I headline at night in Vegas, and that's so there's going to be some some stuff that's a little bit little bit on the edge, not quite over the edge though. Now the one thing like that I get from you just from like uh, talking to you is you you don't have an ego about you. So like when people recognize you, how how do you how do you 
deal with that because you seem like you're very calm. Like you, you seem like you don't know you're a celebrity. You know what I, I mean? don't. I don't. I forget that I'm a celebrity until somebody actually recognizes me. Um, I'll tell you how I do it is that I don't take I don't take the celebrity part seriously. It's to me, it's a it's a job. It's a character I play. You know, Terry Fader, when you see Terry Fader on billboards or when you see Terry Fader on America's Got Talent or on any other show or you see Terry Fader at the Mirage or at the New York, New York Casino, you know, or even at a road show, you're that person on stage is a character I'm playing. That's not me. Terry is the guy that's having dinner before the show and may, and, you know, up watching Hallmark movies with his wife after the show, you know, I don't, really, I'm actually an incredibly boring person in real life. I, uh, I don't, I don't I, think you are. I think you're funny and I think you're oh, charming. No, I mean, I'm boring in that. I don't party. I don't like oh. to go to clubs. I don't, you know, my, my idea of, of the perfect week is at Disney World. You know, I want to go and I don't even care if I ride rides. I just like being in the parks and I just like going. And so for me, you know, everybody's like, oh, it must be great being in Vegas, all the parties and all the clubs. I, I don't go to clubs. I don't party. I, I, I drink socially. I'll have a glass of wine or a martini with a meal. But I but other than that, I just don't drink much. And I don't you know, I don't really do much that uh, that would require that a lot of people would think would be an exciting lifestyle. I hate going to Hollywood parties. I yeah. literally, I loathe going to Hollywood parties. It's the most, I, I feel so uncomfortable and I just feel so out of place uh, because it's not me, you know? Now I would go to a party if uh, all my favorite Hallmark stars are there. You know, I'd like to meet those people because oh my my, I love Hallmark movies. My wife and I watch all the Hallmark movies and we watch, especially at Christmas, man, we, we never miss a, a Hallmark Christmas movie. Yeah. Well, next time there's a Hallmark uh, a party, I'll, I'll call you and say, Terry, I'm going to get you in VIP. And we'll I'm just in. hang out with all these Hallmark people. <laughs> I am in. Yeah. I think it'd be cool. I'd love to I'd love to start doing specials for Hallmark. So I'm I'm working on getting talking to them and saying, hey, you should have me do like specials and I can I can maybe host some of the uh, some of the little things where you're where you're showing off some of the new Hallmark movies that are coming up in the season. Me and my puppets can have some fun. Uh, uh I would love that because I'm a big Hallmark fan, Hallmark movie yeah. fan. No, no. I mean I, I am too. I, I write I write movie scripts and uh I I realized in my writing like uh Three or four years ago, my scripts are probably only good for Hallmark because John Cusack is a knocking on the door saying he wants to do it. <laughs> you know, well, but, there's, something, uh, there's something so pure about Hallmark is that, <clears throat> you know, something I told Angie, we love to watch. It's weird. My wife, Angie, and I, we also love to watch like um, uh, I, Investigation Discovery. So we're watching all these murder, you know, true, true life murder stories. And and I said, you know, the thing I love about Hallmark is that you know when they meet that they're they're good people, you yeah. know. You don't have to worry that they're going to get ripped off or that or that one of them's going to end up in a body bag somewhere. You know that they're two good people searching for the for their soulmate, and that at the end they're going to they're going to find each other, and exactly. it's going to have a happily ever after, and they're going to kiss at the end, and I cry at the end every time when they kiss, and it's like it's beautiful. It's it's just such a it's such a light, and and it really is is just a beautiful thing. So they're positive movies. I love them. I love it. Yeah. So, uh, you you mentioned you like going to Disney World, and I'm assuming you're talking about the one in Florida, right? Yeah, I like Disneyland and Disney World. In fact, this I'm going to Disney World next week, and I'm going to Disneyland next month. In oh month. my god! I live yeah. right by Disneyland. Do you? Yeah, yeah. yeah. I, we go. I like to go as often as I possibly can, and so it's um. It's just, it's my favorite place to just, it's kind of my happy place where I just unwind. And like I said, I don't even really care about the rides. I, I enjoy riding the rides if I can, but I can go there and not ride one ride and still just feel like I had an amazing time. So, well, the reason why I asked that, that, that question is because, uh, I, I heard that alligators are in Florida, like they're more alligators than normal. And I heard they're, they're hanging out at Disney world. So yeah, I was like, that, does that scare you? That's not, no, that that's not really true. There, there, oh, are, okay. there are, and there are signs, you know, and, and a few years ago, there was a little kid that was killed by an alligator. Um, but, you know, but, you know, if you're, if you just don't, you don't cross the, the barriers that say don't cross the barriers. You know, if you're down at the beach and there are signs that say don't get in the water and your kid's playing in the water, uh, sorry, <laughs> you know, I, yeah. I, I mean, not, I mean, I, I, it's horrible. It's terrible. It's horrible. 
but it's not really, as long as you follow the signs, there's nothing to worry about is what I mean. I'm not trying to discount because that was a horrendous thing to happen. But, you know, the signs are there for a reason to tell you that, that, uh, that this is a place you need to stay away from and not, and not go, you know, so yeah. I don't go, I don't go in the areas that say don't go in the areas, but it's really, they really do, um, they really do try to uh, to keep it cleaned out, and they so they do a great job. I feel very safe there. I mean, I, I don't I don't ever, you know, we always stay at the resorts, and so it's wonderful. So, I I I I just have a huge fear of alligators because I I think to me they look like snakes, but they could eat you. So, <laughs> <it's>, uh, <laughs> well, I, would, I would have fear of alligators if I saw one. I've actually seen them. There was an alligator. I used to play a club called the Mustang Club. They just tore it down, and it's a little sad because it was uh, um, Texas. The band was the house band for the Mustang Club back in the late '80s, maybe early '90s. And there was an alligator in a pond right behind the the. They, they called it the mud hole, and I actually saw that alligator a couple of times. But you know, they nobody ever messed with it. And I think yeah. I think that there were rumors that it had eaten a couple of dogs, you know, people's dogs or something. But you know how those things are. I don't know if it. I don't know what it ate, but I did see it there once. Yeah. There, there definitely was an alligator there. It'd be it'd be cool if like alligators could talk because then we could interview this alligator and say, "Hey, is it true you ate the dogs?" And he'd be like, "Yes." Yeah, exactly. <laughs> oh, that was a bad joke. I'm sorry. Too. Well, I'm a, I'm just a person who follows the rules, so uh, you know it, it's so horrendous when somebody does something really dumb, and you know if there's a sign that says "Don't go past this sign." There's, they put that sign there for a reason. You know, they said, don't go near this water. And and people, they, I just don't understand people that just ignore it and pretend like, you know, oh, that doesn't count for me. It's like, no, actually it counts for everybody. You know, if, right. if this is there because the, the, you shouldn't go near the water, you know? And so, so I don't, I just make sure and obey the rules. I don't, I don't, I'm not one of those rebels that's like, yeah, screw you. I'm going to go, I'm going to go wherever <laughs> I want to. You can't tell me what, you know, it's like, I just heard a story about this lady that, that this that there was a, a alligator that lived in a pond like the one I was just telling you about the mud hole and and she said I want to pet the alligator and the lady said that her friend said well the alligator just ate a deer last week and the and I saw it like attack a deer and she goes I don't look like a deer and she went down to the dang water and she pet and she the, the alligator killed her it's like <laughs> Lord people so yeah if you're gonna go in and try to pet an alligator you probably need to be scared of that alligator but. Yeah. One thing is that we always heard like that that alligators you that they would chase you, but uh, but I don't that you should go serpentine because they don't they don't go, but they don't really chase. They're more lungers, so yeah. they don't catch you on the first shot. That they, they're probably not going to chase you. So so you're, you're the alligators are not that dangerous. I don't go in the water anyway. If it's not yeah. if it's a swimming pool, I ain't in it. So so I I have three more questions because I want to respect your time, but I I have to tell you this: when next time you say, "Oh, the rules don't apply for me," you should say, "Yeah, the rules don't apply for me either because I'm a celebrity." <laughs> <laughs> well, I certainly don't feel that way, <laughs> and I certainly don't understand any celebrity who feels that way. You know, I feel I don't feel like I'm any different than any other person at Disney when I'm there within the throngs of people. I don't feel like I deserve special treatment. Oh no, no! I'm just a guy, you know. I'm just a normal person. So, I was just trying to make you laugh. The alligator joke was stupid. I apologize. <laughs> they can't all be winners, Terry. <laughs> no, that's right. That's right. You have to call through, don't you? <laughs> now you mentioned that uh, during the pandemic you started doing comedy clubs, and I I find that a little fascinating because how how come you? Uh, you never, after America's Got Talent, you never wanted to do comic clubs. You just did theaters. How come you didn't do them both? Um, there were no theaters open. The only thing that they, they it was um, four comedy clubs that opened around the country, and I booked for all four of them. No, uh, no, I know that. I meant like when you won and you, you know, you got the theater gig, you didn't practice in comedy clubs or you didn't want to do that? No, yourself? no. I, I, no comedy clubs would book me because I was a ventriloquist. So I had submitted to comedy clubs all over and I was told afterwards by some of these comedy clubs, oh man, as soon as we saw your ventriloquist, we threw it in the trash. We didn't like ventriloquists. And then I, here I win, get my own headlining gig in Vegas. And so uh, I had always wanted, it was a dream of mine to play comedy clubs. So I, I had to wait until COVID to do it, but it was a lot of fun. It was a ball. I, I had a oh great time and, and I got to perform, uh, you know, and uh, even though it was, 
it wasn't a, you know, I would have packed the place out had it not been for COVID, but they were doing this, the six foot, you know, the tables had to be six feet apart. And so it was as many people as they could get in there, but it was, yeah. uh, I did it for the fun of it. I, and, and to get back on stage, I didn't do it because it was paid good money. Cause it didn't, it was just really purely to get me back on stage to, so I could uh, scratch that itch that I have to perform. Yeah. Well, this might not mean anything, but if I ever owned a comedy club, like, 20 years ago in the past i would have booked you regardless of what other clubs said i would you know i would have said i want terry because he's a funny charming guy <laughs> well thank you <laughs> yeah and then uh this next question might be a little sensitive and if you don't want to answer it i totally 100 percent respect that but i heard uh, on the google that in a nice way you told your father to kick rocks hmm is that no. true? No, not, oh. not that I know of. Um, well, you can't believe everything you read on I Google. I was never man. disrespectful. I, I was raised to be to respect my parents, so I've never oh. been disrespectful to either parent. So, I mean, I did, you know, my father and I were estranged. He's He passed away in 2014. And, and we had not spoken since about 2002, not by my choice, by his choice. But um, right. I did, you know, he... Uh, my dad was an authoritarian. He he did not like, he wanted to be the ultimate authority. And so uh, I had a conversation with him in 2002. And I said, you know, dad, I, I love you. And I want to have a friendship, but you have to understand I'm a, I'm a grown man now. And that, and you have to realize that my opinion is just as valid as your opinion on pretty much any subject, because now I'm, I'm an adult. And uh, he said, I can't live like that with I, my child has to, has to submit. And I said, I don't have to submit anymore because I'm I'm an adult. Right. I respect you, but I won't submit to you and uh, to your authority anymore. And and uh, he left and I never saw him again or spoke to him again. And and it, it was sad. But, you know, that again, that was his choice, not mine. Yeah, maybe that's what I read then, because like the power men of, of, you know, because I heard when birds are, are, you know, like what they'll do is when the, another bird is ready to fly is they'll pick up the bird and they'll throw them out the nest. And if they fly great, but if they fall down, they they're like, okay, maybe that's, you know what I mean? I don't know. Yeah. It, but it was just, I was to a point where uh, my dad had had too, too much of a, of a, a say and was, and was an authority figure to me. And once I, I kind of broke away from that, I said, look, I'm no longer under your authority. I now have my own family and I am now, my own authority, not, I'm not under your, uh, absolute authority. And his, he felt like that as long as I was alive and he was alive, I had to be, I had to obey him and, and I had to submit myself to him. And I said, no, it's not going to work that way. I'm now I'm out traveling. I'm touring. I'm, I'm making my own money. I've, I've got my own life. I've got my own house. I'm, I'm no longer under your authoritative watch. Yeah. And he, he couldn't live that way. It was, it was kind of weird. It's, you know, normally a parent would, want their child to kind of grow up and become their own personal, their own independent person. But my dad didn't, my dad wanted me to be subservient to him yeah. and, and have to obey him. And it was like, mm, look, it's great up until you're 18, but no, once you become an adult, uh, you can respect your parents' uh, opinion, but it, you don't have to obey them uh, when you have your own family. You know, I, I totally agree because I have daddy issues. And uh, before the pandemic, I told my dad, I was like, yeah, kick rocks. I'm a comedian. Then the pandemic happened. Everything shut down. I was like, Dad, can I come back? <laughs> <laughs> but uh, okay. So I actually lied. I have two more questions, but this one's a funny question. It's not really a real question. When you won America's Got Talent, and uh, Jerry Springer came up to you to give you an award, did you say Jerry? <laughs> yeah, it was. I'll tell you the funniest thing about Jerry. He was really one of the sweetest human beings I've ever met. That man was just a, a absolute, genuinely nice person. Yeah. He was so cool. Um, he would come down when there were two hundred of us down in this. Uh, I called it the dungeon. It was a. Uh, it was a uh, uh, being shot in L.A. in Hollywood, and and there were these. It, it was like white walls and. And they had curtains separating the different acts. So we were all in there and we were putting, you know, we were getting ready and rehearsing and practicing. And Jerry would come down there and would sign autographs and take pictures for every single, he'd be down there two hours and three hours sometimes 
making sure, talking to people. He was just a genuinely sweet person. But the funniest part was that he, we could not get him to stop putting the microphone in front of the puppet. And oh. if you're a ventriloquist, all the all the sound is coming out of my mouth. The puppet, there, there is nothing coming out of the puppet's mouth. Right. <laughs> So they had to start la putting a lavalier mic on me because Jerry would put the mic in front of the puppet every, and we'd say, Jerry, they would say, Jerry, don't put the mic in front of the puppet. But as soon as the puppet started talking, he would put that mic in front of the puppet. So, uh, but he was a, he was a great guy. He was a sweet man. Yeah. And then uh, my last question for you is uh, Terry, if you could go back in a time machine and uh, talk to a younger version of yourself it could be from t yesterday or 20 years ago what advice would you would you tell yourself and like everything is going to be okay what kind of advice would you tell yourself i would say that when you make it make sure you sign your own checks all right don't ever give your don't ever let somebody else handle your money make sure you have complete and total control of your own money and that you you sign every single check you the only person who has signing authority on checks needs to be yourself and your wife period no one because you know been taken advantage of it's, it's an old story every almost every entertainer i know of has had that problem but uh but it's it's advice that i would t definitely give to myself and say you know when you hit it uh it's going to happen just don't ever give anyone control of your money but yourself ever so wow. i'm so glad you said that and you did say uh terry uh this kid named Keith Reyes is going to harass you to do his podcast. Say no. <laughs> Terry, where can the folks at home follow and support you at? Well, um, I've got all the socials going. So terryfader.com. Uh, anything is at Terry Fader. So it's Facebook, uh, Instagram, um, what else? Uh, uh, TikTok, all of it. And I release weekly us music videos that are fun but we're we're also releasing all sorts of other content and so you can just follow me on there and uh and if and also uh if you buy any of my merchandise on my shop which is terryfader.com just click on the shop button 100 percent of the proceeds of everything you buy goes to the terry fader foundation we work with military first responders many other charities kids with cancer saint jude's hospital it's really we do a lot of amazing work and so I don't take the money from from if you want to if you want to purchase something from my website and just know the money is going to help some good people. So so we oh, very much appreciate it. That's awesome. Well, Terry, thank you so much for talking with me and saying yes. It was it was the highlight of my day, and you made oh, me thank smile. You. And thank you so much. Well, I'm happy to do it, and and it was very uh, nice to meet you. Yeah, definitely. Uh, yeah, when you're in, when you're in Anaheim, call me. We'll go get a chicken. You got it. <laughs> All right. Bye, Terry. Have a great day. Thank you. Bye-bye. All right, guys. That was the episode with uh, Terry Fader. Subscribe, rate, review, and tell a friend. You're listening to Razor Riffs with Keith Razor and Alan Lee right here on LA Talk Radio.